to Aurelius Podcast, Episode 3. Today we have Fred Beecher, Director of User Experience Design at The Nerdery. Fred, welcome. Hi, Zach. Thank you. It's good to have you here. So let's just dive right in. Talk to me about what is design strategy? Um, design strategy is, to me, and the way that we talk about it at The Nerdery is using design to help businesses achieve their fundamental business goals. And that could be anything. We're working with a number of churches right now, for example, Hmm. and their business goals are not the same business goals as say a medical device manufacturer. Very, very different, but it's still the same fundamental principle. Right. So design strategy is the way in which you're helping a company meet business goals. Yes, through specifically through using design methods. Okay. Well, so talk about that. I mean, when you say specifically using design methods, what is an example of that for you? Sure. So uh, uh, one of the keys for that is, of course, understanding the customer that the business is trying to reach. Because if we don't understand the customer, then um, we're basically just guessing which is not strategic at all. <laughs> I mean, mm. I, I suppose there are ways to strategically use guessing, but just doing stuff because you think it's good is not going to help. Um, and one of the ways that I think design can be extremely strategic, if that's even a thing, um, is by helping business businesses completely transform to the point where it's not that they do a research project or two with users, Mm -hmm. but they start to change their culture where they have this continuous feedback loop of an understanding of how their customers are experiencing whatever their product or service it is. Sure. Okay. So I, I really like that point. And I want to go back to something that you said that started us on this, which is, Helping customers or our organization, if we're internal, Mm -hmm. meet their business goals with design methods. Mm -hmm. One would assume that we have to first understand what those business goals are. Mm -hmm. How should we go about doing that? Design methods. Talk about (laughs) it. Dive right in. Those design methods. Yeah. So, I mean, you've heard me talk about the buckets before. So, the, the way that I speak to external clients and internal sales staff uh, and folks like that about user experience design is that there's five major areas of activity in which we need to do something in order to truly provide the value uh, that design can really provide a business. Uh, And the first bucket is business strategy, which Mm -hmm. is understanding the uh, the business context uh, of the specific organization we're working for. Again, the nerdery is an agency, so we work for lots of different kinds of companies. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're internal, that would be that would be more of an ongoing process and less um, discovery, uh, which is um, in terms of the way that we do it at an agency is it's it's fairly similar for each client but mm-hmm. then after that then everything sort of diverges um, the second bucket is users um, or, or or even more broadly people mm-hmm. because the true value of what we do is that we are not only solving business problems but we're we're solving business problems by solving the business's customers' problems. Sure. So that's that's the real value. Sure. So if we don't understand if we don't understand what the business is trying to do, we can't be successful. If we don't understand the business's customers, we can't be successful. Um, so the next bucket is content. Um, even if we are working with a hardcore back end engineering system, mm-hmm. there's still content somewhere. And as you and I both know, content is often the last thing on a business person's mind. But that is sort of the tip of the spear a lot of the time Mm -hmm. when it comes to providing business value. So that's we need to make sure that we address that in some way. Um, Since we're designers, we should probably also design something, (laughs) which is the fourth bucket. Um, 
And when uh, both content and design are sort of split up into two other buckets, but that's not super important, but we need to do something in both of those. Mm -hmm. And the final one is evaluation. Okay. Um, and really it's not a bucket on its own. That's something that can and should be done throughout all of the other buckets. Yeah. Um, because even if a design is extremely well researched, we do tons of really in-depth ethnographic research with users. A design is still basically a really educated guess. Sure. So what we can do is we use more design methods to test uh, our designs to find out where they fail and where they don't fail. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And that's what and, and through doing this and, and establishing this sort of pattern as a culture uh, in a business, this is this is a way where we can really help help a business transform how they do what they do. But within each of these um Within each of these buckets, there are tons of different methods. And when we are solving a business problem, one of the things that I talk to people on our design team about is that, you know, we need to figure out what level of investment we need to make in each of those buckets in order to solve that problem in the most efficient way possible. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we can have a low budget client who comes in, they really need some particular change in their business mm -hmm. they don't have a lot to invest in it there's a lot of different things that we can do in each of those buckets that are cheap uh, in terms of the time that it takes to do them or they're scrappy or they're you know they're against quote unquote best practice mm -hmm. but they get the job done um now, if we skip one of those buckets, like mm -hmm. if we were to instead invest a little bit more in the rest of the buckets and skip the research bucket, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. we would not provide value. We would maybe provide a little bit of value, but it wouldn't be the full amount that we can provide. And so when we are putting together an approach, we are thinking about, OK, what are the constraints yeah. and what level of investment is ap appropriate for each of these and so we can choose maybe a cheap method for one mm -hmm. but maybe a more in-depth method for another because there's a lot of unknowns around the customer base for example okay but the the business goals are fairly straightforward so we don't need to spend a lot of time figuring out what those are but we do need to spend a lot of time figuring out what the customer's needs are sure there are so many questions i want to ask and topics i want to dive into off of that the, you know, I love the fact that you mentioned we can't skip a bucket. So just to summarize what I hear you saying, and you tell me if I'm regurgitating this incorrectly, it really boils down to getting some understanding of what we're trying to do as a business, as an mm -hmm. organization, getting also then an understanding of who we're trying to serve people, yes. customers, users, doesn't matter what you call them, right? Combining what we know from those two things and making smart decisions based off of that. Yes. And testing those decisions to see if they were in fact smart. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So that is actually a topic that I want to kind of dive into with you. And we've done with other people um, on the podcast before. How do you know you're doing the right things? You mentioned solving problems, providing value. Mm -hmm. How do you know you're solving the right problems? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, and that's not one that I have an easy, it, it doesn't have an easy answer. Mm -hmm. um, because frankly, a lot of the time, that's something where we do kind of have to go with our best guess. We can, we can work with stakeholders and try and, 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 and gather a deep understanding of an industry, a deep understanding of a client's place within that, within that industry, their mm -hmm. competitors, uh, the competing goals, maybe different departments have all of that sort of business context. And based on that, we can hypothesize that, okay, problem A is the one that you need to focus on. Now, once we make that decision, mm -hmm. and, and it's not even really a decision, it's it's a hypothesis, we can say, all right, let's fart around with that one for a little bit and and maybe assume that this is the right problem to solve. Let's see what solving it would do. And we can then go and um, 
have ideas, which is what designers do. Mm -hmm. our, the, the, our fundamental work is to imagine the future. And so it doesn't, when we imagine the future, we don't have to imagine the future as it for sure 100% will be because imagining how it shouldn't be or how it could potentially be in the best of all possible worlds. I mean, those are very uh, valid, useful things that can teach us a lot. So what we can do is we can have ideas based on this hyp hypothesis that this is the right problem to solve and then put those ideas in front of people and gauge their reaction. Now, this is this is highly qualitative mm -hmm. and highly subjective, mm -hmm. but it's better than nothing. <laughs> I like that you make that point. I like that you make that point. And I will take that moment to actually even jump in and ask a follow-on question. Before I do, again, boiling it down to say, the question was, how do we know we're solving the right mm -hmm. problems? And you basically talked about all of this to say, we can't be 100% sure. Correct. Right? But somewhere along the line, we convince people we're working with that we should pursue a solution to this problem. We convince, some, we convince somebody or we make a case that these are the right problems to solve. I would say that there's a difference between exploring a solution mm. and pursuing a solution. Okay. I think what we can do is we can convince uh, people or business leaders that this is a so this is a problem that it is worth exploring a solution to. We might not be onto it, but it's better to explore that solution mm. to the mm. problem uh, rather than pursue it first because if we pursue it that level of investment is so much greater that makes a ton of sense so before we even go into that because it's worth going into how do we do that how do we convince somebody that this is a worthwhile problem to solve because that would suggest that it's the right problem to solve right mm -hmm. or that we have confidence that it's the right problem to solve how do we do that well i mean there's first of all there's not ever only one problem sure <laughs> it, like what is what is the most important problem to solve right now i think that's that's the question that we can potentially answer so the way that we figure that out is we use design methods to mm -hmm. actually go through and try and solve the problem so we work collaboratively and 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 as partners with stakeholders and i think that's the key um, to really take on their problems and make them our problems okay because once we when we do that we can uh, really dig deep into it and and we start to take on ownership of the solution so if we work with these organizations to identify all the possible problems they could potentially solve we can work through with them to prioritize which might be the right problem to start with mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. um, through collaborative working sessions and prioritization exercises and things like that mm -hmm. we can narrow down usually a consensus on where to start mm -hmm. and then we can start solving that by doing really lo-fi design methods like my favorite old saw prototyping mm -hmm. because if you if you if you <laughs> hypothesize that this is a right problem to solve Let's just solve it. Let's have a few ideas around it. They don't have to be fully researched or yeah. anything. Let's just take a stab at it and see what happens. Yeah. And it's that seeing what happens that's really key because maybe it doesn't move people at all. Maybe people go, oh, yeah, you know, that never happens to me. But what happens to me is this other thing. Mm -hmm. And you hear that a couple of times and you take that back to the stakeholders and say, you know what? we weren't really getting a lot of traction on this solution. People weren't really interested in it, but they did keep mentioning this other thing that bugs them a lot. What do you think about solving that? Where does that fit in our priorities? And then maybe mm -hmm. we, we pivot and we go and we try and do a super lo-fi solution to that and see mm -hmm. where that lands us. And maybe the reaction there is like, oh yeah, we're now we're really solving a problem. And so that tells us that, yeah, Let's focus on this one and actually pursue this a little bit further. But to go back to what I was saying before about evaluation, yeah. we can do that anywhere. So that doesn't, you know, we don't need to just do that at the beginning and then spend a million dollars developing something and assume that it's going to work at the end. We can bring those people along mm. for the for the ride essentially as we go through because there's going there are going to be elements of the solution which our initial assumptions are going to get wrong for sure. 
Sure. A relative degree mm-hmm. of incorrect in any case, right? Yes. Going back to something you said, I want to dig into. You keep going back to this place where we say prioritizing that against, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe the business goals or the business strategy to determine which problems we should chase after a solution for. In mm-hmm. your case, your example, doing a lo fi prototype. Specifically, prioritize how prioritize against what how do we go about doing that that that's a good question um you know and this is where we get into a discussion of potentially very specific design methods like okay. there's the the book that um every design strategist loves game storming which has lots of different fun activities that you can do to help people do that um but a lot of the time it can be more deep than that you need to really understand a lot more about what's happening with the business and this is where sort of the other big buzzwordy thing comes in which is big data because a lot of a lot of uh, organizations now their data is getting bigger so it's not just web analytics anymore for mm-hmm. example so um, there can be uh, a lot of detailed data analysis that goes into um, a collaborative workshop for example where you know the different stakeholders from different business units for example might come into this workshop with um, a lot of data and potentially some insight from that data to contribute to the decision making there i think one of the the keys though is is that collaboration and in mm-hmm. uh, and because you can't have collaboration without communication and a lot of the time, you know, businesses are very, very walled off. Their units are, are walled off from one mm-hmm. another. And so only when they're talking together uh, and working together, can we really see what is what is really what really needs to happen from the perspective of the entire business, not just a single business unit. Interesting. So a follow on question to that, we can help people get together and communicate more. But we still have to do this exercise of, you know, prioritizing in some way against what they know to say these are problems worth pursuing a solution for or, te- or you know, creating a solution to determine whether or not it's a, it's a viable one to pursue using your language. Mm-hmm. Directly asking what form should that take to successfully do that, to successfully prioritize again, because it sounds like a lot of work data is getting bigger. You're completely right. There's a lot of different sources. How do we get all of that together? What form should that take to effectively prioritize against that to do great design and product work? Well, I mean, really the form is fairly simple. It needs to be a conversation, Mm. Um, preferably a facilitated conversation Okay. because at large organizations, with different business units that don't regularly communicate with one another there's often a lot of politics and 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 turf uh guarding and things like that so having a facilitator in there to help keep people on track help people focus on the task at hand which is deciding upon a problem to solve Mm -hmm. in this particular case is is really really helpful and that's where um that's where design strategy comes in is have a a design strategist is going to have uh extremely strong facilitation skills and will be able to um to shepherd c and v level stakeholders through the muddy waters of conversation and ambiguity to a point of confidence in the next step at the very least okay Okay. I want to turn this to a question I wanted to ask as a follow-up to your earlier statement. Where does business strategy end and design strategy begin? That's a good question. I my my gut reaction is to say that neither ever end. Because a Business always needs to have a strategy to survive and grow in the marketplace. And design is, I feel fairly confident in saying that design will always have a place in that world. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was having a conversation with someone earlier today that said, you know, now design is ascendant, but what if something else comes <laughs> along? And I, I can guarantee you that something else will come along, but I can also guarantee you that design will not go away. People will not suddenly stop caring Mm -hmm. about having stuff that works good because we, we now literally carry good design with us around in our pockets Mm -hmm. as long as we're not carrying around a note seven and it explodes because then it's not in our pocket. Then everybody's carrying around (laughs) our pockets. Yes. (laughs) So assuming that the good design isn't exploding, yeah. you know, good design is now um, infusing people's lives at at all levels in the Western world, I'll okay. say, because um, I know it's not how it is here everywhere. Um, but I really don't think that that it's going away. And yeah. and design, the, the thing that makes design so different is or the way that design strategy interacts with business strategy is this obsessive focus on the customer, on the end customer, because that is going to transform how businesses do their strategy. Mm -hmm. And if businesses Mm -hmm. suddenly stop caring about their customers, they're not going to have any customers. There's something wrong. I want to pause you there for a moment because a comment that I want to make, or actually let me ask the question differently because I like where this is going, but you said you know, business strategy and design strategy never really end. One doesn't stop and the other one begins. A better question to ask perhaps is what does design strategy entail that business strategy does not? Mm. That's a good question. And I I think I have a reasonable answer to that one. One (laughs) is again, the obsessive focus on the customer. Okay. And the other is iteration. Okay. Um, in traditional business, the it's 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 super testosterone intensive and you know leaders have are under a great deal of pressure to make the right decision and know the right answer you know what i've always said the difference between a junior and a senior designer is that a senior designer is comfortable saying i don't know Mm -hmm. and does and a great designer will tell you that they don't know but they know how to figure it out and so having that mindset as part of a business is revolutionary because what that does is that that allows a business to no longer be afraid of failure. It allows them to essentially monetize failure because <laughs> failure will teach them something and reduce the chance of the, that similar failure. Yeah going forward now assuming that the business is set up to actually learn from its failure which yeah. is a whole other see, discussion and that's and see and that's where i wanted to uh for lack of a term pounce yeah. and just say my correction because i completely agree with you but my correction in this conversation as an industry design and product has been the goal is not failure the goal is learning yes <clears throat> for sure Um, but sometimes you learn from positive experiences and sometimes you learn from negative experiences. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. I would say that an organization has to be set up to be a learning organization. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, uh, 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 an HBR, uh, Harvard business review article, uh, about, um, creating a learning organization. I think it was, I can't remember. It was fairly recently that that Mm. came out, um, I have highlighted the title, which indicates to me that I need to read it. I have not yet read it. So, but it's a thing. (laughs) Well, we can make sure to have that as a link in the summary of our podcast discussion for sure. That would be great. I'm going to jump in and add another comment too. And I want you to react to this. It sounds to me like you're saying, and if you are, I agree that design strategy, design methods, and that way of thinking and problem solving can and should actually drive and influence business strategy. Absolutely. Go into your take of that. Go into detail on what that means for you. Well, I mean, that's, you know, now we're, now we're in the territory of, of specifically talking about design thinking, which is essentially adopting a design 
mindset in order to conduct your business strategy. Hmm. And, and, you know, of course I'm biased because I'm a designer and not necessarily a businessman. Um, but I have seen this in almost 20 years of doing user experience design that this approach works mm. and not only does it work but it helps when it doesn't work as well or, or, or because it helps us uh not take not go too far down a road before we can't turn back which allows a business to really uh, invest in innovation because they know that something's going to come out of it mm -hmm. and it might not be what they expect but they have the confidence that they have the methods and the staff who can use the methods to experiment with this stuff to see how it can um, really drive them forward and with the the pace of change in business today it's i mean you have to be like that you have to be nimble in in order to survive sure. um, one of the things i like to talk about when i talk about the nerdery is that right now we're probably on nerdery 4.0 like the fourth <laughs> version of the nerdery as a company as a company uh, and and potentially uh, we're we're probably actually right now at 4.5 okay um and you know we're looking at you know, I don't know exactly what the time frame is for the 5.0 release, <laughs> but it's an it's an organization that's continuously changing and and adapting to the new business climate. Mm -hmm. So like when they started, mobile wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not WAP, not not, WAP not phones, an option, not yeah, a thing. WAP yeah. phones were there. And I remember, you know, in I think 1999 talking to a friend saying, yeah, I really want to design for WAP. That sounds really cool. And now people probably don't even know what WAP is anymore. You can still live that dream, Fred. I don't want to live that dream. That's now a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how things change. No kidding. No kidding. So let's actually latch on to something that you, you started getting into, which is, you know, these things can actually help businesses be successful, yeah. even, even in, in times and places where it doesn't seem obvious where it's going to lead to that success. But you and I both know businesses and business strategy is going to be on the hook for something objective, actionable, clinical in a way, right? We're really talking about some sort of metric or some sort of, you know, line in the sand, binary, true or false, yes or no, mm -hmm. we hit this target or we didn't. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, and I would argue even still today, design strategy or user experience design or those sort of things have not been on the hook for that. How would we bridge that gap? Well, um, I have many favorite words. My second favorite word is outcome. Okay. And that is a word that comes straight out of agile, mm. the agile methodology. And what I love about that word is that it articulates a change that a business wants to see in the world hmm. as a result of some effort. And that's very, very vague because this uh, this encompasses a, a huge sphere of activity. Um, and so if a design and business team can collaborate to identify the very specific outcome that they want to have of an effort, then the next step is identifying, okay, well, what metrics are going to show us that we got there? So if you start just talking about metrics, you're missing the mark yep. because a metric is just a number. And, you know, I'm captain qualitative over here. So numbers are interesting to me, mm -hmm. but I'd rather have, you know, a paragraph of text or a bunch of stories mm -hmm. combined with some numbers. Yeah. That's going to really tell me what's going on. It's going to say what's happening and it's going to say why. And I believe that you can quantify qualitative data and it's it's not easy it's time intensive but i think it can be really worthwhile mm -hmm. um, and what that's going to do is that's going to help us understand whether we have told the story that we think that we told 
I love everything you're saying, and I feel like you almost stole words from my mouth. Um, I love it because people ask me, well, how do we me- how do we measure design? Hmm. How do we measure user experience? How do we measure the uh, the work as you know, people who build products or a product organization? Quantitative data, the same with user research, tells you what, not the why. Mm-hmm. And you should have both. And so what mm-hmm. you're advocating for is exactly that, which I agree with, by the way, which is a, an understanding of why that leads to the what, right? So the mm-hmm. why, meaning that outcome. And then we can attach the what. Well, these metrics, right? Like yeah. and here are these expressions, these things, these outcomes we should see. And here are metrics we would know we can use to measure those outcomes. Is that fair? Yeah, we can we can say, you know, here's here's an outcome that we're shooting for. Here are a series of metrics, some of them quantitative, some of them qualitative. Um, And like I said, I think you can quantify qualitative data, so it (laughs) it could it could get fuzzy in there. But yeah, you could with some effort definitely identify something that you can measure Mm -hmm. um, to identify whether you've hit that now measurement is a whole other thing and that's another conversation probably because when we're talking about transforming a business and transforming the culture of a business to be more customer centric or uh uh, or to have more consistent contact with our customers a lot of that is through measurement and Mm. if if a a a cost if a a business does not have that culture then it's going to be difficult for them to actually measure the things that will tell them whether they've reached that outcome. So that's where that sort of where this, this product work that we're doing or, uh, or, or using design as a business strategy is it really opens up a massive can of worms (laughs) that really needs to be opened up. The world will be better when those worms are free and in the wild. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah. Okay. That's fair. Um, What role does it play? Or I should say, what role does a designer or a product manager or a person making the thing play in defining those outcomes with the business? Uh, That's that's a really good question. Um, And I think it's different depending on whether that person is internal and part of a product team yeah. or an external consultant. Now I will say that that those lines are starting to blur. For example, we have people at the nerdery who are product owners mm-hmm. of our clients' products. It's really fascinating stuff. As that, as external consultants. Yes. yes. Which is a really weird setup, but sometimes it needs to be that way. Okay. Um so if you are if you are internal, I think that you have a whole lot of responsibility for driving that that forward and mm. defining those outcomes and defining the metrics. Um, I would say that a a C level person is probably ultimately accountable for the success of a product, but it's that product owner who is responsible for it. Mm. So they are going to be doing a lot of a lot of that work where they're defining that and because uh, the role of a a product owner is so um inter inter and multidisciplinary you need to know a lot of things really well to succeed in that role so you need to know what you're trying to do um and you need to understand the people you're doing it for it's it's like design plus and you know over the (laughs) the the past you know Uh, almost 10 years now maybe i don't know um i've seen a lot of senior level designers transfer naturally into product management and ownership Mm. Uh, and some have actually come back which i find interesting yeah (laughs) yeah Uh, but it's it's definitely a natural progression i think for a ux designer now if you are external your responsibility is different i think your responsibility is to shepherd the organization through that process for themselves and that gets back to what i was talking before about facilitation okay is asking them the right questions getting them communicating with one another to to figure out what is best for them now a lot of the time if especially if we have a deep um uh, a a deep pool of experience in a particular vertical Mm -hmm. um we can say 
well, we've worked with these other clients within this particular industry. And, you know, if, uh, this is a common outcome that people are, are seeking. And here are some ways that we've measured that before. So we can we can add some of that consultative value. OK, but l- largely that decision is up to the end client. Yeah. Well, and I mean, what you're really describing to use your own language is the difference between outcomes and metrics, right? Metrics are largely the same and you can apply those many of the same metrics universally across company and industry and even problem to be solved. Mm -hmm. But the outcomes are the ones that really should express which metrics make sense Right, because you want that objective number or measurement, as you mentioned, to an outcome. But depending on how clearly defined that outcome is, will help you understand whether or not the right metrics are being used. Exactly, because you can you can and uh, this is a worst outcome that you could possibly have, which is increased sales. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, but I would argue, I would argue that that is a metric. Well, I mean, there's a metric that can, there's multiple, you know, there's, it's just confusing because, you know, there's lots of different types of sales and it's very broad. So, you know, which audience are Mm. we focusing on? It's, it isn't, it's an outcome. It's a reasonable outcome, but it's not very helpful in terms of strategy because strategy is basically a plan to accomplish a goal. Yeah. And it's, if it's such a broad goal, you you can't come up with a great plan mm-hmm. to achieve that particular goal. But if you have a really uh, well-defined goal or outcome, then you can work, I think, fairly effectively and efficiently towards achieving that. And as well as articulating very specific metrics that you can look at to tell if you are achieving that. I think that's totally fair. How does design and product work? design strategy, product strategy, help fulfill a larger company's mission or vision? Well, <laughs> this is this is the awkward time in the podcast where I get to parrot my company's CEO. <laughs> um, what uh, our, our CEO, Tom O'Neill, has been saying lately is that every company is going to be, need to become a software company in some way, shape, or form. And I totally understand what he's talking about because for example a construction company might not have anything obvious to do with software except they're communicating with customers they're managing tons of data Mm -hmm. Um, there's now a lot of uh, hand tools out there that are connected to the internet Mm -hmm. for uh, all sorts of different reasons there's just more data more decisions to be made and margins are tighter and all sorts of reasons that software needs to start becoming the focus of a or not not necessarily the focus but a critical component of infrastructure it's like you know any business that hires people has an hr department right it's becoming like that Whether you call it that or not right yeah whether you call it that or something else (laughs) um But software is becoming a way of doing business. And what's interesting is that when you're talking about a digital product, it's never done. Mm -hmm. And that is a complete and total mind shift for a lot of businesses. And so to understand that is is really critical. Hmm. Uh, And this is the point in the conversation where I have completely lost the thread of what you had asked me. (laughs) What was it that you asked me again? Well, you know, where we started (laughs) with this, I was I was asking, so how does design strategy, product strategy help fulfill a larger company's mission or vision? Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so trying to really achieve any mission in in this world is going to involve software at this point um because you're without software without data in a lot of cases you're not going to really understand your customer and if you don't understand your customer you are going to be very much behind giant corporations are making amazing efforts to understand their customers they're investing literally tens of millions of dollars in understanding their customers Mm -hmm. so if you as a business aren't doing this 
you are going to get left behind. Yeah. So in in some way it is keeping up. In other ways, it's leaping ahead. Because if you really understand your customers well and can anticipate their needs, or to get all Marxist for a second, if you can produce new needs in them, mm -hmm. that is where business success lies. Interesting. At the end of the day, I hear everything boiling down to some very basic principles that we even started the conversation with. Start with clearly defined goals and understanding of what we're trying to do. Feverishly and unendingly chase after <laughs> an understanding of your customers or your users. Yes, unendingly. <laughs> Com combine the understanding of those two things to make the best informed decisions that you can and continue to evaluate that. Yep, and and... I think another key here is really integrating your customers as a key component of your business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, one of the things that Jared Spool likes to talk about is he says that it's something like, uh, I think every person in the company should observe users using the product every six weeks, something like that. Um, and that to me, like, for example, that's a metric. Mm -hmm. That's a success metric. Is that happening hmm. or is that not happening? Or to what extent is that happening? Yeah. Because if, if that's not fully happening, then the business isn't fully uh, performing as well as it could. Yeah. Interesting. This is great stuff, Fred. We appreciate you coming on the podcast. I want to ask you, before we wrap anything up, anything you'd like to share with the listeners? Well, of course. I lead a large design team, so... What does a large design team need? More designers. Um, we're doing some really cool work at the nerdery. Like I said, we have people who are functioning as product owners, which is amazing. Um, and we're doing, a, uh, we're starting to do a lot more product work and um, really be trusted partners with our clients. And um, we're getting the the opportunity to really innovate with a lot of our clients and uh, they point us in a direction mm -hmm. and we go in that direction and and help them achieve the outcomes that they're looking for but it it may not be what they had originally conceived which is basically the best thing in the world for a designer mm -hmm. um, and so right now we're hiring a, a number of roles um, three specifically, one is we're looking for visual designers, um, also known as user interface designers. We are also looking for senior level user experience designers who can come in and lead projects right away. Uh, and we also have a fairly unique role called the experience strategist, mm -hmm. which we're hiring for. Now, this is a very senior role and also very relevant to our conversation because what this role does is it's partially billable, partially a sales role where they work with uh, some of our larger potential clients to identify truly strategic opportunities and then work with them through the sales process and then the discovery process after the, the sale has been made uh, and then transition slowly to, to the, uh, the end production team after that. So um, that is a very specialized role and we're looking for very specific people mm -hmm. for that particular role. But mm -hmm. I would be happy to have a conversation with anyone. Um, I am the world's easiest person to Google. I have mm -hmm. a weird name <laughs> and a loud mouth. So uh, you can reach me to at uh, fbeecher at nerdery.com if you are interested and we can go from there. Great. Where can people find more information about the nerdery, these jobs? you uh nerdery.com slash jobs all right you guys go check it out if you're interested in doing the work that fred and i discussed on this podcast fred beecher director of ux and design at the nerdery thank you so much for joining us well thanks for having me zach it's been a real pleasure all right we will see you guys next time Thanks for listening to Aurelius Podcast, talking about product strategy and design strategy. We are the first platform of its kind to help you solve the right problems for your customers and your business and build products and services that truly matter. You can check us out at AureliusLab.com. That is www.aureliuslab.com. You can check us out on Twitter at AureliusLab and Instagram at Aurelius Lab. 
We'll see you next time.